This is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Isn't that what Psalm 118 says? I'm so thankful for you, and I'm so thankful that we get to celebrate God's wisdom and His Word. We're in part three of Wisdomology 101, and we need the Holy Spirit's help, so let's pray and ask Him to help us. Precious Holy Spirit, welcome. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives, in the rooms where all of our friends are at, Lord, right now. And Holy Spirit, you have no problem conveying, helping, um, uplifting, encouraging us because that's what Jesus brought you for an assignment to help us. And we need your help, Holy Spirit, right now. I pray that, Lord, there's some of us that are just struggling with, Lord, feeling alone, feeling, Lord, without love, feeling, Lord, like we're just cut off. Help us, Holy Spirit. Do what you do so well and begin to minister the comfort of God the Father to us. Comfort us. Jesus said that you would show us all things, that you would teach us, that you would help unfold the Word of God for us. Holy Spirit, do that for us right now. Some of my dear friends, they're struggling, and it's not because God doesn't dearly love them. Precious Holy Spirit, we just need you as the spirit of wisdom and understanding to help us right now. And we believe we receive that. Just say that out loud where you're at. I believe I receive the help of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God bless you. Back to the basics, Wisdomology Part 3. And today, in this part, we're going to be talking about bandwidth. I know, that's a little bit of an unusual subject, but you know, listen, sadly, I've seen so many Christians through the years come under the pressure of trials, tribulation, and just sink deeper and deeper, and that is not God's plan for your life. No, neither is it God's will for your life or His desire for you. You know, some people make a religion out of believing that God's given everybody trials and tribulations and trying to knock them down and trying to humiliate them. And that's not what God does. God loves you and God gives you a plan to overcome. God, even through the book of Revelation, he says to those that overcome, they are given the reward. So God is calling you and I to be overcomers. Thank God for that. And that's what wisdomology and getting back to the basics is all about. If God's love is not the variable, and you know, come on, you know He loves you, then what is the variable in life? It's wisdom and how much of that wisdom you have. Generally speaking, what I've noticed in times of great adversary and testing and temptation and times of trauma, because that's what happens in life. Sometimes we go through deep water. Sometimes we go through the fire. This is what I've perceived is that God never has trouble transmitting the answer to people. But that's some people's perception. They think, I'm praying, but God's having trouble getting the answer to me. God doesn't maybe want, maybe God's withholding his love, or maybe with God is withholding the good things from me. Look, God never has trouble releasing and giving. God's always talking. He's always giving. He's always speaking. He's always communicating, and he's always loving. The problem that I've seen in life is that oftentimes we struggle receiving. Our antenna, so to speak, is broken or it needs repair or it needs to be broadened. The bandwidth of our antenna needs to be broadened. The reality is that we have a difficult time receiving God's answers, no matter how freely he gives. Because don't forget, God freely gave his son Jesus, right? God never struggles transmitting his love, his grace, his help, his courage, his anointing, his wisdom or his power. After all, look at Romans 5 verse 8. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't like God's like, I'm going to wait until they're not sinners anymore, and then I'll send my only begotten son. No, while we were still sinners, God so loved us. But could we receive it? That's the big, that's the big variable in life. We, on the other hand, we have a problem receiving. We are what I would call bandwidth challenged. Bandwidth. So let's talk about that a little bit. What is bandwidth? It's the maximum amount or volume of information that can be transmitted over an internet connection in a given amount of time. So the question is, is do you have a bandwidth that's kind of like this? How much information can you get through this? Think about water. How much water can you get through this? Or 
Do you have a bandwidth connection that's like this? Right? What would you rather have? This or this? See, you can have a bandwidth this size, or do you have a bandwidth this size when it comes to your internet connection? Now, some also refer to bandwidth as the energy or the mental capacity required to deal with a life crisis. So can you imagine trying to buy something on Amazon and having to wait 30 minutes for each page to load? You wouldn't tolerate that, would you? You'd just give up. You might even blame it on Amazon. Here you're trying to get your order through and you're loading pages with a bandwidth of this size when what's required is a bandwidth maybe of this size or at least half that size. And every time you try to load a page, it's taking a half an hour. You're going to give up. You're going to blame somebody. Why? Because we have zero tolerance for a narrow bandwidth in life. We rely on the invisible, don't we? Can you imagine buying a car and the radio has such a narrow bandwidth that it only gets one station? The audacity. Somebody sold me a car. I need to get rid of it. I don't want this car. But sir, it's a brand new Maserati. I don't care. Throw it away. The bandwidth is too narrow, so just dump it. Come on. Well, you and I know Bandwidth is important to us when it comes to radio, when it comes to internet, when it comes to connection. It's so interesting how bandwidth has become something so important to us in life. Bandwidth is basically a measurement on something invisible, but it has become so important to us as humans. We don't want to wait five seconds for a page to load. We're exasperated when there's no cell signal, right? You see people walking around with their phone in a place trying to get cell signal and they're angry about it. You know, we want Wi-Fi. How come I can't get the Wi-Fi password? You know, what about my internet speed? How come things are loading so slow when you hear kids, mom, I've used up all my gigs. <laughs> We love the invisible anymore. It's so funny how we love the invisible when it comes to just natural life. But when it comes to spiritual things, we seem to be so ignorant of how powerful the invisible is. You know, a few years ago, I was working on, I work with a recording program on my computer quite a bit. And it wasn't that long ago that I bought this, this huge virtual plugin. So I bought it online and it would be transferred to me online. So Everything's invisible, and it took like several hours for this purchase to download, and I was in amazement. I, I mean, I was baffled. I, I was thinking, how come? Because you know what? We get so used to instant, don't we? And I'm thinking, how huge is this plugin that it's taking hours to load? And it just really, I, I marveled at it. But that's the world we live in, where we have such a low tolerance for a narrow bandwidth or for things that don't get transferred quickly. There was a little boy and he was trying to explain to his dad why they needed a faster network at home with more, guess what, bandwidth. And the boy was getting exasperated. And finally, he said, Dad, Dad, listen to me. He said, it's like you trying to squeeze into your pants that you used to wear 15 years ago. The dad's like, oh, okay, now I get what you're talking about. With this new frontier, couples working at home, they don't even compete for closet space anymore. Guess what? They compete for bandwidth and how to download and upload their work. That's what life has become, a fight for the invisible. So based on that, now let me transfer this line of thought to your spiritual bandwidth. That's right. You've got a spiritual bandwidth. Each one of us has a spiritual bandwidth that is our streaming ability to download wisdom. It's set by our faith. We receive wisdom by faith. Spiritual bandwidth increases as an act of faith. If you don't ask for wisdom, guess what? You don't get wisdom. And guess what Proverbs 7 says? In part 1 and part 2, we talked about this. Proverbs 4 verse 7 says, Get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get what? Get understanding, the ability to unfold. Like who cares if you can download something and then you can't, um, you know, you can't like open it up, right? You want to not only download the wisdom, you want to be able to open it up and use it. Life is not a teacher. Life is not a teacher. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. He uses experience. He uses people. And of course, he uses the word of God. But it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us. 
I know some people that have experienced lots of life and they get still more foolish with every consequence they experience. I have to laugh when I hear people saying, well, Jim's going through another hard time. Hopefully he'll learn from this. And it's like, you don't learn without wisdom. Trials don't make you wise. Wisdom makes you wise. Just because you're older, it doesn't mean that you're wiser unless you choose to grow your spiritual bandwidth. You got to grow it. And it's a decision you make. Let's take a look at James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Look at this. If any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously. Ah, oh, that's my Father God. And without rebuke or blame, see, no condemnation, and it will be given to that person. But he must ask for wisdom in faith, without doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. Now look at verse 7. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he or she will receive anything, anything at all from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable and restless in all of his ways and everything he thinks, feels, or decides. Oh, my friend, isn't that amazing? See, nobody is born with spiritual bandwidth. Nobody has broad, broadband wisdom just automatically. Your heart must be gradually grown to process and receive wisdom. And it's called growth. Remember, Jesus had to increase and grow in wisdom. That's what we learned in Luke 2. Now, I want to just back up on... Um, when we're looking at um, James 1, verse 7, where it says, For such a person ought not to think or expect that they will receive anything at all from the Lord. When you're double-minded and you take your bandwidth, that little channel that you have that's hooking up to God's wisdom, and you get that double-minded, it's almost like you just put a knot in your straw. You're trying to receive something from God. And see, for those who are listening on radio or, or podcast, I just knotted my straw up. And you can't get anything through that. Look, all the praying won't pull anything through that knotted straw. Why? Because you just took the little bit of bandwidth you had and you totally diminished it. You've got to believe. That's why James 1 says, you, um, when it backs up to verse 6, it says you've got to ask in faith without doubting, without knots, without other beliefs, just wholeheartedly believing on God. 1 Kings 4, verse 29. We're talking about Solomon here. In 1 Kings 4, 29, it says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. When I was a boy, I read that verse, and I began just praying, God, enlarge my heart as the sand by the seashore so I can hold more wisdom. And you know, the more I asked God for wisdom, the more He downloaded that broadband connection. He began Again, increasing my spiritual bandwidth, bandwidth for wisdom, wisdom for decisions. Let's face it, great decisions make life work. Case in point, when you chose Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you became a child of God. What a great decision. But that required you hearing the word of God, hearing the wisdom of God and accepting it. You see, you just made a choice to make your life work when you accepted Jesus. You made your eternity work when you accepted Jesus. Edwin Lewis Cole, I love his writing, and he used to say this, being a male is a matter of birth. Being a man is a matter of choice. See, there are some things that we are inherently born with, but wisdom is a choice. You choose it. We live in a day where preference and opinion are exalted far above the truth. People don't even want to know the truth with a capital T. They so have made an idol out of their own opinion, out of their own preferences. That's not wisdom. Wisdom brings comfort. Listen to me. Wisdom brings comfort because it is an accurate application of the standard of life or the straight edge of life. Now, the pursuit of comfort, on the other hand, brings chaos. Why? 
because it's the pursuit of an outcome without the principle. What do you mean, Pastor Stephen? What I mean is it's like wanting the 10th floor, but completely having disrespect for the first floor, the foundational floor of the building. That, as you know, is a complete explosion. Have you ever seen those demolition teams that bring down those old hotels? They go after the first floor and the principle, the very foundation, and the explosion goes off and they show those cameras in slow motion. And when the first floor disappears, all the top floors, it doesn't matter if there's 10 floors, 20, 40, the whole building collapses on itself. That's the slow motion picture of life when you completely resent and have disrespect for the first floor, the principal floor, wisdom. You got to celebrate floor number one, the foundation. Here's the problem. Rewriting sin as a win doesn't make it so. You can have that as a preference. You can have it as a thought, but it doesn't make it so. That's subjective morality. So all the depression, the brokenness, the longingness, the emptiness persist and they persist on and on. Great decisions are how you ultimately become who you are. So why don't we prioritize our decisions? Isn't that a great question? We think because God loves us, therefore his will is just automatic. His will is just done. Ah, truthfully, we underestimate our decisions and the unlimited possibilities available. The enemy of your life wants you to diminish, wants you to diminish the weight of your decisions. Why? So he can destroy you, so he can rob from you, ultimately, so he can kill you. So you must increase your bandwidth. Your spiritual bandwidth has to grow because growth is essential. We're talking about what's essential in this day and age. Growth is essential. It's basic to life. Look at Jesus again. I kind of referred to this, but in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says this, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature, and then look, and in favor with God and men. You see that? When you increase in wisdom, you automatically increase in favor with God and with man. As your wisdom quotient goes up, so does your favor with God and with man. So why would we think increasing in wisdom is an option? If Jesus had to increase in wisdom, and I know this, you don't think you're better than Jesus. No, no, no. I know that about you. You don't think you're better than Jesus. So if Jesus had to increase in wisdom, why don't we realize and prioritize the fact, the truth that you and I need to increase in wisdom? Wisdom is a requirement for true favor. The God kind. It opens the God kind of doors. Did you know that the golden key to most God kind of doors is favor? And if you're going to increase in favor, you have to increase in the wisdom of God. Wisdom is not intellect or smarts. Remember that. Never forget it. It's not about IQ. Wisdom is the principal thing. It is the foundational thing to life. And if you're not growing, you're not in God's will. Not being corrected, that's not God's will. You're not experiencing God's love. How can you experience God's love contrary to his wisdom when it says that um, Hebrews 12 verse 8, if you are exempt from correction, then you are not a true child of God. So then how can you really experience the love of God? You see, you've got this, you got this bent old straw trying to get God's love through it because this is your broadband connection. This is your bandwidth, your spiritual bandwidth. And some people are like, oh, I just, I'm not really, Pastor Stephen, I'm just not really experiencing or feeling God's love. See, they're wanting this much information of love to come through. They want to experience this, but they've got this much wisdom. Jesus increased in wisdom. And as he did, he increased in favor with God and with man. Oh, this is exciting. John 15, verse 2, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he said, God the Father continually cleanses and prunes every branch that's fruitful. See, that's the wisdom of God. See, there's a lot of talk of what's essential today, but growth is essential to life. Your life, anything alive has got to grow. That's the basic. That's the one-on-one. That is essential. 
You have a physical body, but you are a spiritual being and your spirit being desires, longs, and must grow. So whether you're building a house, a tower, a business, a ministry, a marriage, a family, anything, growth demands a true foundation to support it. It's essential. It's critical. It's basic. And if your foundation in any way is compromised, all growth is set up for disaster. I love it when people come to Christ. They get born again. But now growth must occur. You've heard me say this before. Getting converted is not getting discipled. Therefore, getting the right to wisdom, getting the rights Getting the rights, the legal rights to wisdom, is not the actual downloading of wisdom. You know, when I make a purchase online, there is the legality of me going through the process of making the purchase. Then I have the right to download whatever the program is. But first, I have to purchase it. Pam and I, we had a friend in Nashville, a family that we were praying for. This guy's name was Daryl. And Daryl was just a wonderful guy, talented guy. I loved his personality. He's very charismatic. I mean, he was just such a really neat guy, owned a business, was very successful. And we kept praying that Daryl would come to Jesus. We just kept praying that he would come to the Lord. And um, I remember one day he, you know, he came to my home and he was drunk and it was early in the morning. And we just told Daryl we're praying for him. So one day, Pam and I, we came home off the road and Daryl was there to meet us and he couldn't wait to talk to us. And he said, Stephen and Pam, he says, I got saved. I, I asked Jesus into my life. I asked Jesus to save me. OK, so he said he got converted. Well, that was a wonderful thing. But then he be, proceeded to tell us that he had tons of conditions. When he came to Jesus, he said he wanted Jesus to save him. But in other words, he didn't want Jesus to be the Lord of his life. He still wanted his opinion. He still wanted his preferences. He still wanted his habits. He still wanted his addictions. He said, I, I wanted Jesus to save me. But at the same time, too, I wanted Jesus to allow me to keep all this stuff. So what he was saying was, I wanted the king of wisdom to save me, but I don't want any of his wisdom. I want his blessing, but I don't want his principle. I want his wisdom. He's saying, I want the 13th, the 14th, the 20th, and the 28th floor, but I have no regard and no respect for floor one, for the principle, for the foundation of life. I have no regard. Well, the whole thing imploded on Daryl. I mean, he ended up losing his marriage. He ended up losing his kids. He ended up losing his business. He ended up losing his credit. Everything, Daryl ended up losing big in life, not because Jesus didn't want to save him and completely help him, but he didn't want God's wisdom. He wanted God's benefits. He wanted to get saved, but he wanted to pull all of that muck and mire into the house of God. Daryl wanted to be born again, but he didn't want to grow. And that is essential to life. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18 says this, but grow spiritually mature in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The knowledge of whom? Jesus. Who is Jesus? The word, the wisdom of God. Remember Luke two, verse 52. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus has to increase in wisdom. So do you and I. God has designed everything to grow and you are no exception. Growth is basic to your life. Growth is what you are designed for and it's essential. It's basic to your design. Spiritual bandwidth is wisdom and your ability to receive wisdom. Remember, wisdom precedes favor. Now, there's nothing wrong with having this much wisdom, right? But are you having trouble receiving answers to your prayers? Because God's transmitting. He's faithful to transmit. But the question is, are you trying to get this big of an answer through this small of wisdom? So now don't be discouraged and don't let condemnation in. But the thing is, maybe you're operating on a single straw of spiritual bandwidth, believing for 100 gigabytes of an answer of a download. Maybe you're believing for this much of God's goodness and, and this much of God's favor, and you've got this much wisdom. Well, God is a God of process. He's increasing you. The Bible says that Jesus increased in wisdom. So maybe Jesus went from one straw of wisdom to two straws of wisdom and kept developing 
developing to the point where his ministry kicked off at age 30 with this much wisdom. Do you have broadband wisdom for unlimited downloads? When you pray, are you praying the wisdom of God? Or are you just praying your requests and shooting into the sky like with your shotgun? Oh God, and what about this? And what about this? You know, there's been things that I've prayed for as a boy that I thought, my goodness, if God answered that, if God actually got that through my tiny little straw, that would have been just terrible. That would have been horrendous. I didn't want that. I wanted to marry my grade two teacher. My goodness, that wouldn't have been good at all. See, you know, change is coming. It can either be forced on you as a consequence because you lack spiritual broadband width, or you're missing out on wisdom's downloads, or you can be activating change with growth and increase because you have the spiritual bandwidth to easily receive wisdom. This is basic to life. This is one-on-one -on -one stuff. Growth is part of our life and our living. You were made for wisdom. Spiritually speaking, your, your bandwidth growth is essential to receiving from God your Father. Every one of us must replace sinful, stinking thinking with God's unfailing wisdom, right? Proverbs 8, verses 35 to 36. For whoever finds me, wisdom says, finds life and draws forth and obtains favor from the Lord. Well, we just, read, we just figured that out, didn't we? From Jesus growing in wisdom and growing in favor. Then verse 36, But he who misses me, says wisdom, or sins against me, says wisdom, wrongs and injures himself. All who hate me love and court death. Pam and I got this other day, this tool in the kitchen where you can kind of like um, scrape lemon skin and, and do all that stuff. And it's, some, not, it's, it's finer than a shredder. But apparently she was using the tool but used it wrong and she injured herself misusing this tool. Look, the Bible says when you misuse wisdom, when you miss wisdom or you sin against wisdom, you wrong and injure yourself. And all those who hate wisdom, like my friend Daryl, he hated wisdom. And when he hated wisdom, guess what he did? He loved and he actually courted death. Okay, application time. How do we increase your bandwidth for wisdom? See, it's kind of like setting your thermostat in your house. When you don't like the facts or the circumstances, the temperature in your home or your apartment, you could do this. You could complain. That's what a lot of people do. That's what many people do about life. They complain. They just lament. Or you could blame the circumstances. Oh, the weather is just making my life miserable. I hear a lot of people do that. You could suffer. You could make a theology about just suffering. Some people have this bear down and suffer mentality and, you know, what can you do, right? You just got to suffer through. Or you could include it in your theology. You know, I think God's trying to teach me something. This must be his will that I'm just, you know, I'm freezing cold in my house. Or you could practice escapism. Some people live a life of escaping the facts, trying to distract themselves, going to another party, going to another job, going to another doctor. Maybe it's another relationship. Just turn off all the symptoms whatever way you can. Go to another doctor and get some more meds just to turn off the symptoms. But my friend, escaping is not the way to go at things. You open your spiritual bandwidth using wisdom like you set your thermostat. You set your thermostat in faith. Right? Even in your house, you set your thermostat in faith. You don't feel the set of the temperature, but you believe it's coming. You walk in the house and maybe you've been gone on vacation and it's in the wintertime and maybe the house is really cold. You set the temperature at what you want and you do it by faith because even though you've set it at this very warm temperature, it's not warm yet, is it? But you believe it's coming. So this is how we do the same thing. We use truth to always supersede the facts. Don't surrender. Don't succumb to the facts or build a theology around the facts. Set the temperature. You set your spiritual bandwidth like a thermostat, regardless of the condition to the experience, the desired outcome, even in the midst of extremes, the storms of life. So the invisible decides the physical again. You don't submit to the facts. You don't blame the circumstances. You don't build a religious doctrine around the challenges of life. No, 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 no. You do something about it. You use your faith to set your life on wisdom. So 
Pastor Stephen, how do we do this? It's very easy. Let me just give you five quick points. Number one, you humble yourself. Humility welcomes wisdom. Proverbs 15 verse 33 says, The reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord brings instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. See, it's the instructions for the thermostat. The Bible is the instruction for setting your life, for setting your thermostat. See, there's no points for pride. Pride is anti-wisdom. Pride is anti-truth. It constricts your spiritual bandwidth. You know, this is what pride does to your bandwidth. Look at this. Oh, my goodness. I just tied a knot in my straw. That's what pride does. It ties a knot in your belief system, and nothing's getting through that. Nothing. So number one, humble yourself. Number two, set your mind. Colossians 3 verse 2 says, for you to do this, you don't wait for God to do it, you set your mind. Colossians 3 2, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above. James says, remember what we read in James 1? Don't be double-minded. Don't think one temperature and then think another temperature. Don't think, oh, I want it at this nice warm temperature, and then be thinking, oh, but it's so cold. You've got to think one temperature. Elijah told the people in um, Kings, he said, quit limping between two opinions. You've got to stop and set. Now, speaking of set, number three, set your mouth. Proverbs 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it will eat the fruit of it for death or life. You know what? You cannot conquer bad thoughts with good thoughts. You need to profess your faith. You need to speak it out loud. And that requires spoken words, declarations, confessions. So when you set your mind, the next thing you set is your mouth. Your, your mouth becomes a witness to what your mind is thinking. Number four, you got to trust in God. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says this, Lean on, trust in, be confident in the Lord with all of your heart and your mind. Do not rely on your own insight or understanding. So get your hands off of it and trust in God. I'm always aware when I hear people go, You know what, I, I, Stephen, I just got to trust myself. You know, this is what I'm feeling. I just got to trust myself. That's a person that God bless their heart. They don't have wisdom because if they had the wisdom of God's word, they would know, do not trust in yourself. The Word of God says that your heart is wicked and deceitful above all other things. Don't trust your heart. Isaiah said that we're supposed to repent of our thinking and of our thoughts. We're supposed to let go of our way, our opinions, our preferences. Repent of that. Change your mind, your way of doing things, and make it all about Jesus thinking, His thoughts, His Word. Let His truth steer your life. So trust in God, not in man, and especially not in yourself. And then number five, be thankful. This is the rocket fuel for wisdom. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, not for everything, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Look, God's will is His word, is His wisdom. And being thankful is God's great wisdom in every situation because it maximizes faith, it maximizes results. That's the wisdom of God. Be thankful in every situation. So you don't be thankful for the flat tire, but you're thankful as you're changing the tire that it's not raining, or you're thankful that you've got um, you know, a service coming to change your tire, or you're thankful that you're safe. You're thankful that this happens rarely. I don't get flat tires very often. Thank God. Be thankful in the situation, but not for the flat tire, right? That's how you apply God's wisdom. So let me give it to you one more time. Five thoughts. Humble yourself. Number two, set your mind. Number three, set your mouth. Number four, trust in God. And number five, be thankful. Yes, you got to be thankful. Remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says this. God made Christ Jesus our wisdom. Jesus is our wisdom. You can begin your life, your new life, with God's wisdom right now. How do I do that, Pastor Stephen? Remember what I said, you set your mind, set your mouth. Number one, you gotta humble yourself. Well, when you pray this prayer of humility, I wanna lead you in, and you set your mind and you set your mouth. 
you're going to see the course of God's Son coming into your life and suddenly you're going to be adding all this bandwidth, spiritual bandwidth to your life as you focus on Jesus, the source of wisdom. Here's what you do. Just pray this prayer with me. Right now, just say it after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. See, that's humility. Just say, I need you. I need your wisdom in my life. Now you're setting your mind on the wisdom of God. Forgive me of all my sins. You died on a cross for me. You rose up from the grave. That's the wisdom of God. I set my mind. Oh yeah, you say it. Say, I set my mind on your wisdom, on your unfailing word for my life. Come into my heart, Jesus. Be the Lord of my life. In your precious name, amen.